It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. In the book of Revelation, the Lord sits upon a throne overlooking creation and declares, Behold, I am making all things new. Authors Fiona and Terrell Givens take up that theme in their latest book, a readable overview of Christian history, highlighting ways that Latter-day Saint scripture invites us to look at things in a new way, to rethink the nature of sin, salvation, and everything in between, as the subtitle says. Spencer Flumen's here to guest host this episode, talking about the book with Fiona and Terrell. It's called All Things New from the Faith Matters Foundation. Send questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast to mipodcast at byu.edu. Welcome, everyone, to the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Spencer Fluman, guest host, and am thrilled to invite you all to think along with Fiona and Terrell Givens today. Welcome, Fiona, Terrell. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks. Fiona and Terrell have both joined the Maxwell Institute in the past year and a half. They are research scholars here at the Institute, so it's our great pleasure to benefit from their deep learning and their big hearts, and they are both prolific scholars in their own right. We're going to talk today, though, about a new release just published, All Things New, Rethinking Sin, Salvation, and Everything in Between, published by the Faith Matters Foundation. Congrats, you two, on this uh, new book. Thank you. Thanks. It's your fourth co-authored volume. <laughs> Fiona, I turn to you first. What's it like <laughs> working with Terrell as a co-author? Really difficult. <laughs> You know, he, he has objections to all sorts of things, all sorts of truths that should be in there. And uh, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's really an effort to get him to come around and see the correct side of the story. I, I had a feeling that, uh, that that would be your response. In, on, a, on a slightly more serious note, I am interested in that process for you two. You, you work together on um, God Who Weeps, Crucible of Doubt. The Christ Who Heals. So All Things New is this fourth time working together. You both have your own projects and, you're both pro and your own process. What is it like really coming together and, and working together? Um, how, do you, how do you manage that, those questions of voice and content and so on? What does it, what does it look like? I'm, I'm curious, and I, our, our listeners might be too. Well, each one of the four collaborations has been very different mm -hmm. from the ones that went before. Um, for example, our last joint project, The Christ Who Heals, grew principally out of Fiona's complete immersion in early Christian, especially Eastern Orthodox theology. Mm. And so she did the, the bulk of the work in terms of the research and the note taking. Um, in this latest one, I would see it kind of as a is the summation in some ways of all of our work. I, I, I did a rough sketch, a rough draft. Mm -hmm. Then it goes through Fiona's um, mind like a steel trap and some of it makes it through the first edit and some of it doesn't. And then we literally do sit down together and read out loud oh, interesting. each successive draft and critique and comment and and wrestle through uh, as we go through. And we did that how many times? You know, several times. Several times. I have to say, you know, that this is a, a probably not typical for most co-authors, but we we really do pray. We, we invoke mm -hmm. the spirit, um, especially when it comes to the read-throughs, so that we, you know, if there's something that, you know, just doesn't sit quite well with one of us, we can discuss it and change it or explain why we feel it's important to be there so um i quite like that um, but it's a fraught process it is and um i mean yeah. it's hard enough to travel together or to do business together but i don't think anything tries the soul and the relationship as much as writing together because right writing is a reflection of your deepest self you've invested yourself and so to have to negotiate differences in how you're coming together to a project can be very, very difficult. But at the same time, I think I can say that we both feel a real kind of exhilaration in achieving the, the synthesis that we eventually do together. It's a beautiful thing. Well, I, it strikes me that you've just described um, beloved community uh, in a way. I mean, this is, it's, a, it's kind of a beautiful description that we'd expect that kind of wrestle. We'd expect that kind of coming to 
each other across a chasm of either uh, different understanding or, or whatever, and then a, a kind of exhilarating, revelatory, spirit-led kind of uh, communion, as it were. So that's wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear it's worked that way. We, we're certainly the beneficiaries as readers uh, through this process. So you, you, you mentioned, Terrell, that this volume in in some ways is is summative is that right i mean it it, it we hope this isn't a kind of uh last comment <laughs> certainly song. on your thinking yeah <laughs> we, we, we don't want that but in in what ways what I, maybe more um narrowly what specifically prompted this effort to pin all of this down. It's not a long volume, but you cover a lot of ground, historically, theologically, spiritually. What prompted this particular volume? Well, I think it was the feeling that we have been doing this kind of piecemeal in the course of our other works. We've tried to redefine uh, what it, how Latter-day Saints should or do understand God, to try to redefine core concepts, and then it just got to the point where we thought, you know, we really need to do this more systematically. And I think we both have been very much impressed by B.H. Roberts' words on discipleship of the second sort, where he talks very specifically about the need to re-articulate the gospel anew in subsequent generations. And we have found that, you know, we kind of went through this phase in the last generation where, where a lot of people were alienated from the church because of church history problems or because of LGBT issues. But it seems to me that one of the more common features that persists to this day is people are just frustrated with the culture of the church. And it, and it strikes us that that, the, that that culture has been infected and infiltrated to an inordinate degree by assumptions that we bring from our religious past, uh, a Protestant past in particular. And so we thought, well, let's just do the whole thing systematically this time and try to cover all the principal concepts in our vocabulary. We found our speaking engagements, we've um, done a lot of them to be very educative um, as we listened to um, the problems, the issues with which people were um, under which they were laboring, from which they were suffering. And it, it, we could actually see there were specific areas that needed to be addressed or that could be addressed to alleviate the fear and the concern well, talk that we were feeling. That moment were about judgment. I thought that was a real pivotal moment. Oh, in, yes. In a number work. of years ago, um, Terrell and I were invited to give um, a fireside um, at BYU to student ward. And the bishop had said specifically that most if not all of his um, congregation had just returned from missions and they were all struggling and so he said you know can you just come and help and so um, we spent a lot of time with Julian of Norwich and um, it you know I we both felt you know that the, the tenseness and the uh, fear anxiety seep out of these students and oxygen was back in the room and it was lovely. Everybody was happy. Everybody, you know, felt as though they were in a good place. And then there was this young man on the back row and he raised his hand and um, we called upon him and he said, well, what, what do you say about judgment? And, you know, every, of course, all of the oxygen left the room at that point. And I, I asked him, I said, well, how do you feel when you hear the word judgment? He said, I feel fear. I am afraid. And we responded by saying, if you feel fear, that is not God speaking. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ because God never works through fear. It's contrary to his nature. And I think that was helpful. Do you think that was helpful? Well, yeah, because I think that the more we looked and listened, the more we realized that was kind of endemic in the church. There's this anxiety with which most people live the gospel. And that's why we actually started this volume by collecting a whole series of expressions of trauma. And one that was almost humorous, but it was tragic in its own way, <clears throat> was this person remembering as a young child in primary, 
being so deeply traumatized by the words of I am a child of God, the second verse helped me to learn to do his will before it grows too late. And this fear. <laughs> a you know, clock ticking somewhere child, in the exactly. universe. Exactly. And we thought, this yeah. is just wrong. This is just wrong. This is not the spirit of the gospel that we should be enjoying and experiencing. And time and time and time again, it seemed to us that it was traceable to vocabulary and the baggage that this vocabulary carries. And so to just finish the story about judgment, <clears throat> it seems to me remarkable that just two or three conferences ago, Elder Uchtdorf gave a talk in which he defined judgment in ways that were virtually unprecedented in our culture, where he said the day of judgment will be a day of healing, a day when-, when A day of love. A day of love. And, <laughs> and so we have to, we, we realized how immersed we still are in that kind of Calvinist mindset of a God who was waiting to impose judgment on our lives rather than a tutor who is walking through our lives with us to ensure that we get to the destination. Well, and this brings us naturally into the, the book itself. As a reader, I experienced the book in kind of two parts. One, um, as a, a kind of historical overview of what, what we inherited as followers of Christ from various strains of Christianity over time and a kind of great story, as you call it, in the book. And, and then the, a, a kind of restoration revision of that inherited great story. Uh, and that takes a part of the book. And then you take terms in the second part of the book. You take terms, as you've just done for us here with judgment, and you kind of unpack them and, and, and run them through a kind of restoration lens to see how they might look differently, challenge the kind of habits of mind and habits of use uh, that, that, that we employ as Latter-day Saints to try and see what, what the restoration calls, how, how it, the restoration calls us to see those things in new ways. So let me, let me start with that great story um, that, that and, and it's not a big book. So it, it's not like you, you give us all the possible variations of the great story in all of Christian history, but you talk about a kind of dominant received story about God, humans, and the world that, that came to dominate Christian history. Can you walk us through that great story? And then uh, when, when one of you is satisfied with that description, w w jump in and, and then how does the restoration qualify, revise enliven that story for us if okay, we're looking at the Okay, just a point of clarification. Do you mean the great story that is how Christianity unfolds or the great story of the human saga that Christians both. had been telling? Yeah, both. Because they, they're, they're woven together in the book. I, right, it, right. I think it's a great point. Yeah. Uh, they're woven together in the book, right? That, that these are often arguments within Christian communities. Right. Right. Well, you know, it seems striking to me that, that increasingly we, we see mental health professionals across the spectrum are talking more and more about narratives, about the stories that we tell. And each one of us is a character in a narrative. We, we have to place ourselves as a character in a plot that has meaning or we can't get our bearings in life. And many of the greatest thinkers in human history have done this for the human race as a whole. So Nietzsche tells a particular story about human development. Darwin gives us another story. Freud gives us another story. Well, Christianity gave us a story that really begins, as we trace it, with Augustine. And this is a story of catastrophe and of failure and of a plan that has gone awry. And so the entire Christian saga, and we find numerous historians and theologians of, of the Christian tradition who are in complete agreement in this regard, that they say Christianity is the story of salvaging a catastrophe. And, and we just think, what a terrible place to begin. We are inserted into a tragedy, not of our own making or, or fault. And Joseph Smith tells this marvelous saga that begins in a distant past in a positive, optimistic environment where we are called into community with heavenly parents and invited to participate with them. A covenant is established. Earth is created. The, the, the story in the garden unfolds precisely according to plan. And as Latter-day Saints, I think we have failed to recognize that if you change the beginning of the story, then you change the whole plot. And that's why it doesn't work to just kind of tinker around the edges of our vocabulary and our theology. We have to start with that kind of master vision of this grand narrative that is continually a narrative of ascent. Mm 
of progress toward the divine and that sin becomes collateral damage rather than the central motif in this story. So I would say that's that's the basic thrust of what we're, we're trying to right. point to. I, I think that came to me um, when I was doing research for The Christ Who Heals, and I spent much of my time studying the Patristic Fathers. And what struck me was that this was the gospel that Joseph Smith um, was talking about, and, and and really that word restoration resonated with me because I just taken it as another word. But restoration is very different from reformation, and um, and what were they restoring? So essentially, we could, if we started with Augustine, we could see. Um, human life being portrayed as depravity, a fall away from God, original sin, and then it just morphs into the Reformationists and they pick up the same um, issues, but they just engender them with even more fear um, so that we're likely any of us to return to heaven. Um, so it couldn't be a restoration of anything from Augustine on because essentially it is Augustine. And it's only when we go back to the Protistic Fathers that we see this different gospel. Irenaeus in particular. Yeah, Irenaeus, Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, Macrina, Gregory of Nyssa's sister. And it's so optimistic, this idea that we that a mortality was necessary in order for us to become like God or in order for us to obtain immortality. Um, that a universal salvation was preached because we are all um, children of God. And then this phrase, um, God shall be all in all, really captured the minds and hearts of Origen and Gregory of Nyssa particularly because they saw that as a universal salvation. And then salvation wasn't really ever used. It was healing. Um, that's what really struck me, that Christ came to heal um, the human race and, um, and that God's entire love was focused on our progress, return, after having been educated and healed from the woundedness that we either inherit or we experience in our lives. So for me, it was just really exciting. It, it was like, okay, I understand what restoration is now. Restoration is pretty much everything prior to Augustine. And a lot of it actually has been retained in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, it, so you, a Heavenly Mother, for example, has um, a very important place there. Um, but it is really interesting, and quite honestly, I do think that the the um, the fall of the wall um, was huge because it has opened up Eastern Orthodoxy to the West, and there are more Eastern Orthodox theologians now teaching um, and writing in um, in journals that we think are quintessentially. Western. So, for example, in First Things, you know, their, their arguments and their ideas are being taken up, generally argued against, but um, I, I think there's a real discussion now beginning to unfold. And so, for me, I believe that the restoration really is sort of this coming forth of this beautiful church out of the wilderness, which is, which is positive. And the centrality is that God loves us, that we are consubstantial with God. Um, and that that is our goal and our destiny is to become more like God. You don't make an attempt in the book. Again, it's it's not intended to be a comprehensive history. You don't intend in the book to walk us through every um, every rise and fall of what I'll in a shorthand way call the Augustinian strain of of piety in Christian history. But you 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 point to these this set of ideas that becomes powerful at a particular point in early Christian history. It has a real revival among the reformers, and then it it's right up next to Joseph Smith's life because it's that Augustinian strain that animates the Puritans. Exactly. And, and most of the British colonies in the Northeast, New England, are dominated by this Augustinian strain. So this is the, this is the world in which Joseph Smith grows That's right. up. That's right. And, you know, Fiona has done this really beautiful reading of Joseph's encounter with James chapter 1, where she, she, she draws attention to how those words venture and upbraid were, were read in the 1828 dictionary. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that what Joseph is trying to convey is this sense that he has to overcome his fear and trauma of this sovereign deity who is a threatening figure. Mm 
And so it, there's, it's, it's a momentous decision for him to approach God in faith. And we, we're thinking that's, that's why it, it took him so long. He was terrified. The only God he knew is the wrathful, vengeful God of the Old Testament. And you know, there's this idea that, you know, he'd show up and he'd be reprimanded severely for, you know, even attempting to approach God. And then, of course, when the vision opens and Joseph is called by his name, um, he, he just is saturated with absolute love from the divine. And so everything for him changes then. So we wish we would tell the story of the first vision a little bit differently. I see in a lot of church literature and manuals, he learned that God had a body of flesh and bones and there are three distinct individuals. And, and it's, But that's so far from the point, right? He goes home and he's consumed with the love that he experienced. And uh, so we think the most important thing he comes away with in the first vision is that God is a God of body parts and passions. And he relates and identifies with him in that way. And that's the real revolution, I think. Yeah, and that God is a God of love. And, you know, if we look at the biblical text particularly, we, we have this God um, who is wrathful and vengeful and feels it's entirely appropriate, appropriate to massacre innocent Egyptian children, um, to commit genocide. And then we have the God in the New Testament who is a complete antithesis. So they're really not working together. And, and in our faith tradition, we believe that that is the same God. So then we find ourselves in the very uncomfortable situation of having to worship, worship a God who's schizophrenic. And, and so it, it really became very clear to me that God can be one or the other, but he cannot be both wrathful and vengeful and merciful and vulnerable and loving. And um, I, I think that was really helpful. I think it was Macrina, Gregory of Nyssa's sister, who really helped me understand that. She's, and Julian of Norwich, of course, you know, wrath and friendship are two contraries and you can't have a contrary nature in God. Um, otherwise, where would we be? You know, is it, we would, there'd be nothing certain in our life. Certainly, there would be no certainty of, God's, of, of the depth of God's love for us. It is the case that we do focus on Augustine a good bit and, and some people are uncomfortable with that. It seems like we're kind of using him as the, as, as the whipping boy. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we don't doubt for a moment that he was a wonderful, beautiful human being, an earnest seeker. All we're trying to point out is that his ideas were what derailed Christianity. And what's remarkable to me is that you can you can read David Bentley Hart in the Eastern tradition, or you can read N.T. Wright, probably the most popular Christian writer today, and they're saying pretty much the same thing that we're saying. They don't use the word apostasy, but N.T. Wright is, is very emphatic that Christianity takes a wrong turn in the fourth century. And in his book, for example, The Day the Revolution Began, he is trying to recuperate a pre-council, pre-Augustinian version of Christianity. And this is why what's really remarkable is, is remember there was a give and take between Truman Madsen, and I can't remember who some years ago, are Mormons Christian, and then he inverted, well, are Christians Mormon? And in fact, it is in fact the case that there is more and more and more convergence of the contemporary Christian world on points of doctrine that Joseph Smith was revealing in the 1830s and 40s. A passable God, a weeping father, a uh, lack of original sin, personal accountability, a more generous universalist heavenly father. Even the doctrine of theosis is coming to be discussed in journals like Christianity Today. So um, it's, it's really remarkable how this convergence is happening without most people recognizing. And Joseph understood that. You know, he said in order to exercise faith into salvation, we needed to know one, God exists, but the second point was the most important, to know his correct character and attributes. And for me, that was just a floodgate opening. It's like, okay, I can say, no, God would not behave in this way, because Joseph is saying that much of our um, scriptural literature is, is, is full of how we wouldn't behave that way to our own children. And, and yet God feels that he can run roughshod over our humanity. And really, we're, we're, very, um, we're very far from Godhood. We have no power if one was to compare, if one were to compare our power with God's. And so surely um, the God we are worshiping is merciful, merciful, 
um, gentle, long suffering. And I think that's for me a very important. It's like he's going to wait for the duration. He's not in a hurry to go anywhere until every single one of his children have returned home. And that animates my soul with hope and um, calm, actually. Well, and this prompts, uh, this prompts uh, maybe a, a third narrative to insert at this point, because you've, you, what, what you sketch out here, Fiona and Terrell, is, uh, is uh, at least a gentle revision of some Latter-day Saint senses of history. Sometimes we make the Reformation a necessary step toward restoration, and you've, you're, you're, you're calling that into question, not so subtly, uh, that, no, we're, yeah. that, that, that perhaps the recovery of some of these ideas actually necessitates a restoration rather than enables it. Yeah, I, yeah. What, what happens at the time of the Reformation is productive and fruitful. The dissemination of, of writing, dissemination of the Bible and the vernacular, uh, the gradual growth of religious toleration and, and liberty. But, you know, we've gotten a lot of pushback for this. People are so used to seeing the Reformation as the prelude to the Restoration. But when, I, when I've asked my interlocutors, well, can you give me one single example of doctrinal clarity or improvement that was achieved by the Reformation, I, I'm, I'm met with silence. I mean, the Reformation stands for the complete dismissal of sacramentalism, the necessity of sacraments, the complete abolition of the idea of an ordained priesthood. They erect an, a, an absolute impermeable barrier between the living and the dead. They invent the doctrine of substitution or penal substitution as a way of explaining atonement. Um, the justice of God becomes purely retributive justice at the hands of people like Luther and Calvin. Um, we, we could go on and on. Um, it's, it's just not the case that it helped prepare the ground for the restoration. In fact, when Joseph is told in the, gar in the grove that the creeds were an abomination, I think we've erred for 150 years in thinking that it was the medieval creeds that are being referenced. I think it's absolutely clear that it was the Westminster Confession and the Articles of the Church of England that were being referenced because Joseph and Oliver Cowdery, every time they criticized creedal Christianity, they criticized the language of those Protestant creeds that em emphasized a God without body parts and passions in particular. And what I think is so remarkable is that it's very rare for anybody to be able to get outside of the narrative of his time, the paradigmatic narrative. And Joseph was born and raised in a very Puritan Protestant world the 19th century. And uh, for me, that he was able to get over that and see, and then, of course, there was an awful amount of um, anti-Catholic sentiment, which actually permeated our church, unfortunately. But Joseph was Catholic. He was much more Catholic than he was Protestant. He was bringing in more ordinances. He, um, he said that the connection between the dead and the living is absolutely vital. And he saw this project of Zion, of... of, of um, um, sealing the entire human family together and to God was a really important part of that. that, that well, was, and, well, Stephen Webb said that about right. Joseph Smith. He was a Catholic born out of time. Right. Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and at this juncture, it's probably a, a, important for me to call attention to the nuance that you bring in the volume itself, too. It's not as if you describe uh, an, an, a, a great apostasy as a kind of, as you put it, an eclipse or the restoration as the creation of something out of nothing, restoration ex nihilo. You, you call attention to the fact uh, that there are strains within the Christian tradition that resonate with all of these restoration positions that you lay out. And you're, you're quick to call attention to those. So it's not as if you are um, dismissing anything that comes before 1820 as irrelevant to the story exactly. of the restoration. Exactly, yeah, that's a pernicious 
mischaracterization that we're really trying to combat is this notion that there, that there were dark ages in which God's light was completely cut off from the human family. On the contrary, so much of our work and writing has been an effort to weave together the diverse threads of inspired men and women in other religious traditions and cultures and show how they are part of what Joseph had in mind when he talks about bringing a church out of the wilderness rather than reconstituting one ex nihilo. And again, this idea of Joseph um, being out of his time is is his, um, you know, he's saying in order to come out, come out a pure Mormon, we need to be looking for, discovering and engaging with texts that bring us closer to God. So actually, he burst open the canon and said, essentially, anything that is beautiful, lovely and a good report bring that you know we need that in in this is in this community that we are building that we hope will end up incorporating the entire globe in this um and, and this is what i love about joseph is that his um he was so concentrated on the building of zion and it was an extensive zion um i think we appropriated that and and sort of said okay zion will be the church and no one else but we haven't read joseph closely enough because he's saying no it's not it is the entire global community which is why i think he was so generous and you know everywhere you look find beautiful treasures and bring them well, back it's really clear in dnc chapter 10 right when you when you get to verses 52 and following this which i think one of the most remarkable revelations of joseph smith right he receives it in 1829 and there in 1829, the Lord is referring to a church that is already in existence that he identifies as his church. And clearly he's referring to the invisible church, to the church of the pure in heart throughout the world. Um, so we, we need to do more to recapture, I think, the generosity of Joseph Smith's vision in that regard. So what 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 uh, what you've laid out here is no small feat for this book to accomplish. You two, the, you, the, there's a needle to thread here. On the one hand, this is a a kind of daring act of differentiation to say no, the restoration is a a revision of uh, of these particular strains in the Christian tradition, uh, fundamental. But those strains are so strong that we may even use language in, in, and, and have patterns of thought that are actually informed by that broader Christian tradition without even realizing it. So in some ways, the, y your book is a, is a kind of act of differentiation. On the other hand, it's this act of reclamation, generosity, of, of resonating with uh, other parts of the Christian tradition that are in fact... Um, kind of fellow traveling with us as we pursue these strains of restoration thought, that's not an easy needle to thread. I'm excited for readers to, to, to watch you do it and to think along with you as you do it. This prompts a question that I wasn't planning on asking. And that is, what then is the book? Is this an, I want you to, to think about what you've written here. Is this an act of history and description? Is it an act of theology? Is it making a claim about the kind of realities of, of that have been revealed through the restoration? Is it, um, what is it that you, how, how should readers approach this? Cause it, it is breathtaking in its scope. You two, I mean, it really is. Well, I, I'd like to think of it as a kind of multi stranded, um, work of historical theology. Because there are so many instances, where if you look at the, the constituent elements of our theological tradition one by one by one, it's like each concept has its own history. So, so to just take one more example, why, do we, why does repentance carry the kinds of connotations that it does in Christian culture generally and in Latter-day Saint tradition in particular? And it turns out that there's a very simple explanation for how this car ran off the road. And that's because when, when the Greek text was translated into the Vulgate around 400, the word metanoeo for change your heart is translated as do penance. And so the Catholic Church appropriates this concept as a sacrament and repentance for over a thousand years means to pay a penalty, to suffer to inflict or suffer punishment for something you've done. That's the unfortunate thing about Greek and Latin. Greek has lots of words for one thing. So four different words for love, for example. 
Latin is rather like a steamroller. There isn't an awful lot of variation. And when when our, our, our feeling is that when the Greek was being translated into Latin, um, repentance and poenalis, poenalis seem to be, okay, this is what repentance is. But of course, the basis of poenalis is, is punishment. And so to this day, when a Mormon thinks about, right, well, I need to repent, what does that mean? It means I have to somehow feel pain, guilt, suffer, so, right, to prove the earnestness of my... And, and yet so, here's DNC 19 saying, I suffered these things for all that they might right. not suffer if they would repent. Precisely. So <laughs> Repentance is supposed to get you away from the suffering. Exactly. Yeah. And so we try to bring these two threads together to show how the restoration yeah. fills in the missing kind of conceptual background, but to also explain in a very strictly historical sense how we got to where we are. And we try to do the same thing with notions of atonement, with notions of um, salvation, heaven. So let's litany. take a couple of those notions because uh, we, we've, uh, we've, we've talked through kind of the beginning of the, uh, the first major part of the book. The second part of the book is, are these kinds of historical theological case studies, you take these key words that are so just overflowing with meaning and significance to latter-day saints these are these are these are words closest to to the hearts right and, and but you give them you give them nuance you give them new light you reposition them in light of these narratives and that you you've described each of you in your own mind pick one that we haven't talked about yet that you deal with in the book and talk through why that was significant to you. Well, uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll grab sin. Yeah, please. Um, I, I think this is, um, for me, it was a really important um, journey. And, and I think paradigms shift universally. You can't have one group of people run out ahead of the other because there isn't going to be any understanding between the two groups. So I find it incredibly interesting um, the number of studies that are coming out on trauma. And um, you, you, we're, I think we're all familiar with um, PTSD that is suffered by um, returning veterans. But um, then you have somebody like Bessel van der Kolk who is saying that trauma is everywhere. It's in our families. It's in our homes. It's on the streets. And so once you do enough research into trauma, we realize that we're all traumatized, which then takes me to a, a particular verse in the Old Testament that really has bothered me, um, which is, their sins will be on the third and fourth generation. It's like, well, that's not fair. Um, but if we see that as trauma, sin as trauma, then we do understand because trauma does carry on through generations. And I, I think that's been very, very helpful um, for me. It, it's painful. People think of sin as painful. But when we take away that very negative consequence of sin, then we understand Trauma is something that brings people together. Sin essentially divides people. So if somebody were to, work in, to walk into the room and she looked at me and she turned to her friend and she said, um, Fiona has just been excommunicated for something really awful. What does that do? That immediately separates that person from me. And she's not going to come any closer to me in case she catches what is, whatever it is I've got. But if that person were to say, oh, there's Fiona, she's very, very traumatized. She's had a lot of grief in her life, a lot of trauma. Immediately, I'm going to go over because the immediate reaction, I think, of, of humanity is to try and comfort, is to try and come over and alleviate that pain. So vocabulary becomes incredibly important, um, especially when we are, are trying to enact our baptismal covenants, which I think are there for trauma. Um, Terrell and I uh, think that the baptismal covenants were articulated out loud um, in the early church, but they are phenomenal for dealing with woundedness. And each member of the Godhead is represented, if not to ratify, then to sanctify the covenants we are making. So we have the God who takes upon us his birth burdens all the way through his life into Gethsemane unto Golgotha is God the Christ. The God who mourns with us, who mourns is the God of Moses 7, um, God the Father, and then the God who comforts us when we stand in need of comfort is God the Holy Spirit. And this is extraordinary. I mean, this is mind blowing because this is the essence of our religious tradition. And these covenants are made 
easier for us to follow and to live when we are able to see people as wounded and traumatized rather than people as sinful. And I really do think that's what God means with this generational carrying of not sin, but trauma. Mm. Terrell, is there one that stands out to you of your, of your case study? Yeah, I think probably justice. Mm. Um, and it's one that I still haven't finished working through. At the present moment, I'm deeply immersed in a study of the theological origins of contemporary notions regarding justice. But here's what I have learned is that, again, you go to the fourth century, and this is when everything changes on, on a dime, effectively, because the early Christians understood the justice of God to be essentially his validation of human choice. A just God is a God that gives to every person according to what he chooses and desires. I, I think it's really quite beautiful that the Book of Mormon teaches the exact same principle. It calls it the law of restoration. And it's only when we get again to the, 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 the fourth century of the church and then again with a vengeance in the Reformation that justice becomes entirely a matter of retribution. And I remember reading many years ago Nietzsche's critique of Christian ideas of atonement and justice. And I remember at the time just being dumbfounded by the brilliance of his analysis. Because what he pointed out was we think of justice as a kind of zero-sum game. You killed my sister and that inflicted all this pain. So now you have to suffer a commensurate amount of pain, but two negatives don't equal a positive. So Nietzsche's analysis takes it a step further and says the only way that can cancel out is if God feels a delight in that punishment commensurate with the pain of the original injury. You end up with a pretty sadistic deity. You end up with a sadistic deity. But then what is even more remarkable is that you find Thomas Aquinas and 17th and 18th century preachers alike actually describing heaven as consisting in part of our ability to behold the sufferings of the damned and feel good about being exempted from that. So At least this, I'm not with them? Is that I, the yeah, idea? Exactly. Okay. So there's this horribly yeah. perverse strain. Mm. And so I think if we can recover instead the fact that God's justice simply means that he will honor and uphold the sanctity of our choices that we make. Mm. And that's why the most important thing that we can focus on is, is purifying our desires, because if we desire the right thing, as we're told in section 88 verses, what, 32 and following, then we will receive exactly that which we are willing to receive. The gift is there. Um, so it, it kind of defangs justice of all of the kind of malevolent, nasty, retributive aspects and uh, makes for a much more benign paternal father. And this idea of agency, I think, also turns everything on its head. And, and we as members of our faith tradition I put a lot of stock by agency. But when we unravel that word agency, it means that God can no longer be sovereign. He can no longer command. You know, so we see how the biblical text was worked. For everybody, there was a sovereign or a leader, and everybody um, did homage to him. So it's essentially the the fiefdom and the liege lord and the vassals and that really permeates um the particularly the old testament but with agency god cannot command because it's a violation of our aid he cannot coerce um he cannot browbeat us into things and he especially can't hold out this you know if you do not you will be punished and actually, I'm the one who is going to punish you. So for, for me, um, particularly, this idea of agency sort of liberates God from all of these, I feel, fallacious, but definitely um, harmful attributes that um, he has been carrying for generations. Well, one, one final comment from both of you as we, as we kind of wrap up here. I'm, I'm, you, you ask readers here to think anew about language and about the words we use and how we use them and what they, what what meanings come with them you know when we pull out sin what comes with it you know what what is it what is it done to our patterns of thinking what do you hope readers take away from the volume what do you at the at the end the, what what do you hope changes for them well for me i would i would love readers to come away um, having a much deeper deeper sensibility in both their mind and heart as to God's absolute love, unyielding love, and that 
God is with us throughout our journey, will never forsake us and until our journey is done. But for me, it's that idea of God loves each and every one of us. Absolutely, no matter who we are, where we are, or what we have done. Tara, how about you? What do you hope readers uh, come out of this? Well, I know that with? I know that everybody wants to feel better about themselves in their lives, right? Everybody wants to believe that they don't have to feel guilty or, or shamed or traumatized, but they need to have a reason. And so I think what we have tried to present is a reasoned explanation of why there is more grounds there are more grounds to be joyful mm -hmm. than we recognized mm -hmm. and that we can have a rational basis for a more hopeful and celebratory faith. Well, wonderful. Tara, Fiona, if, uh, if you have for others like you have for me widened the, the scope of both love and hope, then, uh, then it was definitely worth your effort uh, to, to write the book. Thank you for writing. Don't quit writing. We, uh, we so love the opportunity to think along with you. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you Thanks so much, much Spencer. Thank you. And that makes 125 episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm excited to see what comes next. Over the past month, we saw some five-star reviews roll in from the likes of Mika1960, NYUT, and Matt Kern, and somebody who goes by Willie Witt. <laughs> Willie Witt with an exclamation mark at the end. They said, this podcast has absolutely increased and deepened my understanding of scriptures, history, and theology. As a 25-year-old wanting to dive deep, I found it so insightful, I can't thank you all enough. All right, well, thank you, Willie Witt. Thanks for sending in that review. Uh, I also saw Sarah Carioca's review. That's Sarioka, that's a, that's a tricky one for me. She said, I especially loved the Briefly interviews. They really helped open my understanding to the hidden pearls in the Book of Mormon. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Sarah. Thanks for listening. And uh, somebody here called Dougie Spice says, My review of this podcast is long overdue. I've listened to all episodes and many of them three to four times. I'm not trying to be clingy. It just takes me longer to process some things. Blair is a refreshingly dispassionate interviewer with equal measures of care for the ideas presented and the people he interviews. My favorite thing about the podcast is the respect for a variety of religious experiences. Well, thank you for that, uh, Doug. I really appreciate that a lot. And thanks to all of you listeners. As an announcement here, I'm finally ready to send out the completest gifts to the people who've listened to every single episode. Um, and, and if you contacted me as a completist at some point, but, but haven't kept up, that's fine. You're still a completist. Uh, watch your email. We'll be reaching out to make sure that nobody changed addresses or anything like that. And, uh, we will get something sent your way. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to every episode. If you're a completist and if you're not, uh, go for the gold. All right. Uh, I'm Blair Hodges and this was the Maxwell Institute podcast, episode 125.